Hello everyone and welcome to Sky Scholar. In the last video, I discussed spherical harmonic analysis and how this approach is used to express the anisotropy maps mathematically. I also highlighted that both the monopole and dipole terms are removed from the acquired data prior to generating these maps. As such, the lowest term in the angular power spectra actually corresponds to the quadrupole. We will move to the multiples in the next video. In this presentation, I want to focus our discussion on the dipole. Charles Lineweaver has published a short history of the dipole measurement up to the time of the COBE satellite, which is linked below. The first measurements of the dipole began in the 1960s and reported an amplitude of about 1 millikelvin. Over the course of the next 30 years, measurements within the Earth's orbit slowly saw the value rise to about 3 millikelvin. The direction of the dipole also became firmly established. Both the differential microwave radiometers and the Ferris horn on the COBE satellite were able to measure the dipole with great precision, and COBE reported this image for the dipole. The DMR measured a dipole magnitude of 3.365 plus or minus 0.027 millikelvin as reported in this paper. The DMR also set the direction of the dipole as follows, which is generally in the direction of the constellation Leo. The Kobe Fierce horn obtained a value of 3.343 plus or minus 0.016 millikelvin in a direction consistent with that obtained by the DMR. The dipole is revealing that the solar system appears to have a velocity of approximately 370 kilometers per second relative to the local group of galaxies. That implies also that the local group of galaxies has a velocity of about 630 kilometers per second relative to the rest frame of the universe. Now you may immediately recognize something very important about the dipole. As I mentioned previously, the dipole can be thought of as a Doppler shift in the monopole signal which arises due to movement relative to the rest frame of the universe. That in itself is a large claim if you think about an ever-changing and expanding universe's ability to have a rest frame. Moreover, since the dipole value is a frame-dependent quantity, it has nothing to do with the last scattering surface of the Big Bang. It is a Doppler shift which affects the monopole. If the Big Bang existed, then it did not produce any meaningful dipole terms. That is important to keep in mind, as it is rather surprising that the second term in the spherical harmonic analysis of the microwave sky has nothing whatsoever to do with the primordial explosion and the last scattering surface. Again, there is no significant dipole terms other than that currently associated with motion relative to the rest frame. The interesting thing about the dipole is that it is actually given by the first derivative of the monopole. Remember the consequences. If the dipole is known, it is possible to calculate the monopole. In fact, this is exactly what happened with the COBE satellite. In addition to measuring the monopole directly with the Fierce horn, the COBE team calculated the value using the dipole. They obtained a value of 2.725 plus or minus 0.001 Kelvin using Furus directly. They then calculated values of 2.714 plus or minus 0.022 using the dipole. The DMR calculated a monopole value of 2.75 plus or minus 0.05 using the dipole. Now given that this is the case, then you have to ask yourselves, why the Planck and WMAP teams never calculated the monopole value at L2 using the dipole. In fact, for both WMAP and Planck, the monopole value used is the same one obtained from the Fierce horn on Kobe. Moreover, as was seen in this video, the Planck team did try to calculate a monopole in a roundabout way. They combined anisotropy results with baryonic acoustic oscillations. So what is going on? Why not just use the dipole measured at L2 and then simply give us the value of the monopole? After all, the WMAP team does publish an image of the dipole. This image is only comprised of the highest three frequencies, namely Q, V, and W. They do not include data from the K and KA bands, presumably because of intense galactic plane interference. But still, if the WMAP team has the dipole, why not calculate the monopole just like the Kobe team did? The answer is simple. The WMAP and Planck team used the Kobe Fierus monopole value to calculate the expected dipole at L2. They then used the calculated dipole to calibrate each of their frequency channels. 
So the image above comes after calibration based on a monopole as measured by Firis, which is why it cannot be used to measure the monopole. The WMAP website describes it in this way. The data will be calibrated to the true temperature differences on the sky by comparing the raw output data to the signal expected from the known dipole anisotropy. In this paper, they give more detail. Calibration occurs in two steps. First, an hourly absolute gain and baseline are determined. The absolute calibration is based on the CMB monopole temperature Mather et al. 1999 and the velocity dependent dipole resulting from WMAP's orbit about the solar system barycenter. The Mather et al. reference is the Kobe monopole value. Essentially, the same approach is taken by the Planck team as one can learn in this paper. For the monopole, they now cite a reference by Fixen instead of Mather, but both results come from the same satellite. So you see, the WMAP and Planck team are calibrating their instruments by computing a dipole which assumes that the monopole at L2 is equal to the value measured by COBE in Earth orbit. As a result, it is impossible for these teams to compute a monopole value at L2 using the dipole, as had been done by the COBE team. Keep in mind also that the monopole has never been observed at L2. Now back to the dipole discussion at hand. There is just one more interesting aspect of the WMAP and Planck papers just cited. In the WMAP paper, it is emphasized that Jupiter is used as a secondary calibration source for the radiometers. In the Planck paper, Jupiter is not used for the HFI calibration. Instead, now the calibration is based on models of Uranus and Neptune. The models state an absolute uncertainty of 5% and the Planck team states that they have some degree of confidence in their use. Yet in the same paper they write, we find large variations between the individual planet measurements in each detector and at each season of the full mission survey, which we attribute to underestimation of the measurement uncertainty. Indeed, the signal from Neptune and Uranus is not expected to vary in time, apart from the difference in solid angle, which are very small and already taken into account. In any case, Perhaps things are not all that well understood relative to calibration using models of Neptune and Uranus. Models are just models and they can produce any result. The key point is that if one is going to calibrate using the dipole for the LFI, why use models of planets for the HFI? Something is not right here. With regards to directly measuring the dipole, I wanted to mention the results of a Soviet satellite, namely RELIT-1. RELIT-1 was launched in 1983 and conducted the first satellite-based analysis of the microwave background, as you can learn in these papers. The Soviets placed RELIT-1 in a high-altitude orbit with a perigee of 1,000 km and an apogee of 700,000 km, as depicted in this sketch. That apogee is equivalent to about half the distance from the Earth to L2. RELIT-1 completed one orbit around the Earth about every 26 days. The satellite was a differential instrument and operated at a single wavelength, namely 8 mm corresponding to 37 gigahertz. It was calibrated by an onboard signal generator and also used thermal emission from the Moon to achieve this end. RELIT-1 is important because it tried to directly measure the dipole. Its first report of the dipole did not give a direction, but only a value of 2.1 plus or minus 0.5 millikelvin, as one can learn in this paper published in 1984. Three years later, in 1987, the RELIC team published a new higher value, namely 3.16 plus or minus 0.12 millikelvin. The new value is outside the initial error bar of their first measurement. However, it was in agreement with values obtained on Earth, as reported by Fixin et al. and Lubin et al. These were two of the three papers cited by the Soviets in their second report. In the end, the RELIT team did not share the 2006 Nobel Prize. This was awarded to the COBE team despite RELIT-1's efforts to measure the microwave background anisotropies from space. Now the story with RELIT continues as there are several concerns. Ten years after the initial RELIT-1 report, Strukov et al. would write a paper in order to justify the launch of RELIT-2. This was to be a multi-frequency instrument, but now with a very different orbit, as they would launch their satellite to the second Lagrangian point. Relative to their previous results, they would write, In spite of the high apogee of the RELIT-1 experiment orbit, and rather low level of its antenna side lobes, we observed a large contribution of the Moon's and the Earth's thermal emission to antenna temperature. Thus, the RELIT-2 experiment cannot have an orbit such as the orbit of the RELIT-1. 
In fact, in the first relit report, they clearly show a strong signal arising from the Earth itself. At perigee, the Earth would always be a problem for relic 1, and the Moon would become more important on the way to apogee. But something more was happening. In justifying relic 2, they report much higher signal for the galaxy with relic 1 than previously observed within the confines of the Earth. This implies that the real dipole signal at L2 is much lower than expected by the WMAP and Planck team based on COBE data. It also raises the possibility that the 2.725 monopole does not exist at L2. Another problem with the RELIT-1 data is its poor signal to noise. The Soviet authors write, it is necessary to stress that the direct comparison of the massives of RELIC-1 and COBE data is impossible. Poor signal to noise ratio in RELIC-1 data causes a necessity to use weighting that dramatically changes a form of output signal. In this case, the spherical harmonics lose their orthogonality and the power of some input harmonics transfer in different output harmonics. Moreover, the transform functions are different for COBE and RELIC-1 radio maps. Something is wrong with the calibration of the RELIC-1 data, as the dipole value cannot be allowed to simply change far outside the error bars, especially when concerns about earthly contributions and problems separating spherical harmonics remain. So you see, there is much more here than first meets the eye. Rather than discounting RELIC-1 data, perhaps the Nobel Committee should have more carefully considered its findings. In any case, when the WMAP and Planck teams use the Ferris monopole to calculate the dipole and calibrate their measurements, they impose something upon the sky at L2, which might not be there at all. Movement through any field can be used to generate the expected dipole once calibration is applied, and herein lies a key problem with both of these satellites. The calibration method used ensured that the expected result will be found at L2. Well, that is all for now. If you enjoyed the video today, promote the channel, mention the video to your friends and your local astronomy club, support me with a like, and subscribe for more videos as we look more closely at the sun, the stars, and beyond. Comments are always welcome down below, and I'll see you soon on our next video.